Hello, students. Today, we're primarily studying the content of organizational structure design. Through studying, we can understand the fundamental aspects of organizational structure, comprehend the process of organizational design, and grasp the basic principles of organizational design. Before diving into the course, we have a question for you all. Let's think about why do we engage in organizational design? Typically, it's for ease of management, to achieve the organization's mission and goals. For every organization, naturally, except for very small or extremely simple organizations, it needs to undergo a design of managerial hierarchy. So, for our typical organizations, they all need to establish several levels of management and administrative structures, clarifying their respective duties and authority as well as interdepartmental division of labor and methods of communication. Therefore, the task of organizational design is to establish the organizational structure and clarify internal relationships. The result of organizational structure design includes providing organizational charts, departmental job descriptions, job assignment plans, job duty descriptions, and flowcharts, and so on. Next. Let's take a closer look at how organizations specifically undertake organizational structure design. First, what we need to do is job design. Job design. It's synonymous with division of labor or job specialization. For example, production workers, office staff, and so on. When conducting job design, we usually need to create a job description like this. So when preparing job descriptions, the first thing we need to do for the job we're designing is to provide a description. This description is mainly meant to express the content of our work, tasks, functions, and its environment, and so on. At the same time, along with our job description, we need to provide some job specifications. These specifications include our basic information, the purpose of the position, as well as the responsibilities and authority of the job itself and some job relationships. Also, our most familiar job qualifications. Finally, this also includes performance indicators. Of course, we need to remind everyone here that when we're conducting job design, we must be moderate. When considering job specialization, it's essential to leverage the advantages of specialization while also trying to avoid some of the shortcomings of job design, such a situation. Next, the next task is departmental design. Departmental design is a horizontal structure of organizational design. Departmental design also involves organizing the work and personnel within our organization into manageable units. So, the purpose of departmental design is effective division of labor. When we're conducting departmental design, there are several principles we need to grasp. The first principle is that organizational structure should be streamlined. Departments must strive to be minimal. Second, necessary functions must ensure the achievement of our organizational goals. The primary functions of the organization must each have corresponding departments. Third, regarding our assessments and inspecting personnel in business departments. They cannot be subordinate to departments they evaluate. In other words, we cannot both be referees and players. These are the three principles of departmental design. In departmental design, based on our job design and departmental design foundation, there are usually five ways to design departments. The first one is functional departmentalization. Functional departmentalization groups specialized activities such as production, finance, marketing, human resources, and research and development, or similar skills requirements, into separate management departments. The second method of departmental design is based on the requirements of products or services. So we usually call it product or service departmentalization. Departments established in this way are currently the most typical methods of division 
The third method of departmental design is what we call geographical departmentalization. Geographical departmentalization divides organizational business activities based on their degree of geographic dispersion and then sets up management departments to manage these activities. This is the third method. The fourth is designed according to customer departmentalization. Customer departmentalization divides organizational business activities based on their different interests and needs of target customers. The fifth method of departmental design is process departmentalization. This method of departmental design organizes business activities according to work or business processes. The third aspect, building upon job and departmental design, involves determining organizational hierarchy. That is, designing the organizational hierarchy. Similarly, designing organizational hierarchy involves two crucial components. Firstly, we have the span of management. And secondly is the levels of management. Let's first look at what the span of management entails. The span of management, often referred to, is the number of subordinates a manager can directly and effectively supervise. As for the levels of management, it refers to the organizational hierarchy. From the highest level of management to the lowest level which manages the organization. Let's now delve deeper into what the span of management entails and what the levels of management are. We just discussed what the span of management means, the number of subordinates directly under a superior's effective leadership. Now, let's understand this with the help of this triangular diagram. This is what we commonly refer to as a tall organizational structure. So, as we just discussed, the span of management refers to the number of subordinates effectively managed by a manager. Let's see, in the topmost layer of this diagram, we have a manager who effectively supervises a total of four subordinates. So, this is what we refer to as the span of management, which is four in this case. Next, let's consider the levels. According to our concept of management levels, from the highest to the lowest level of the organization, we go through several levels of hierarchy. So, let's count how many management levels there are in this structure. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So, in this structure, we have a total of seven management levels. With this structure, let's examine the effective management assistance for in number within seven hierarchical levels. So, in essence, what we have here is a total of 4,096 frontline personnel at the bottommost managerial level. These all fall under what we term as managerial personnel, correct? And within these managerial ranks, all these individuals, correct? So, adding up these managerial ranks, we have a total of 1,365 individuals. This means that within such an organization, our managerial personnel total to 1,365 individuals, while our frontline staff amount to 4,096 individuals. All right, next. Let's look at another organizational structure. We refer to this as a flat structure. Similarly, Let's analyze this type of structure. Its management span and levels can be seen through this diagram. We can observe that below the top level manager, what is the actual management span? It's 16. This means that in this organizational structure, the top level manager has direct effective subordinates, numbering 16. Now, let's also consider what its levels are. 1, 2, 3, 4. What's it? It's 4. So, actually, from this structure, we can see that the management span is 16 individuals, and there are four levels. Similarly, let's look at the total number of frontline staff. Isn't it the same as the tall structures? But here, there's a difference, because our levels are different. Let's take a look at the total number of our management staff from the top level down to our third level. Our management staff amounts to only 273 individuals. By comparing these two diagrams, we understand that despite having the same number of frontline staff, the number of management personnel 
differs. So, in taller hierarchical structures, the total number of management personnel required is higher. When facing a flatter structure like this, our management layers will be much fewer. Therefore, through the comparison of the two diagrams, we can easily observe that organizational layers and management spans are inversely proportional. In other words, because as we discussed, the fewer the organizational layers, what happens? The fewer the organizational layers, as we just saw in this flatter structure, the wider the span. Do you see the span? It's wider. The span is wider. Correspondingly, as we mentioned, when an organization has fewer levels, like in a flat structure, its levels are fewer. But its span of management, you see, it's narrower. So, what we mean is that the number of management levels and the span of management are inversely related. So, what we're saying is, in a flat structure, the span of management is larger. And, the organization has fewer management levels. In a tall structure, the span of management is smaller, but there are more management levels. Next, let's see what advantages and disadvantages these two organizational structures have. First, let's take a look at the flat structure. Actually, we can clearly see through the comparison of the two diagrams that the span of management is broader and our levels of management are fewer. Right. This is one of its characteristics. Then there's the tall structure. Its span of management is smaller, but it has more levels. So, it also implies they each have their own advantages and disadvantages. Now, let's look at the flat structure. Because of its broader span, which is larger, and fewer levels. So, it actually promotes that initiative and autonomy of subordinates. Similarly, it helps develop the management abilities of subordinates. The third advantage is it facilitates information transfer or transmission. Why? Because it has fewer levels. When directives are issued with fewer levels to go through, it's easier for information to transmit. The final advantage is saving management costs. Because as we just saw, the same number of personnel requires different numbers of managers. For a flat structure, only a few hundred managers are needed. But for a tall structure, thousands of managers are required. This is an advantage. As for disadvantages, the first is it's not conducive to control because of its wide span. The second one is that it requires a relatively high level of competence from managers. And the third one is that it is prone to forming decision-making bottlenecks. These are advantages and disadvantages of the flat organizational structure. Let's take a look at the advantages and disadvantages of the tall organizational structure. Firstly, it is conducive to control because the top level manager only needs to manage a few effective subordinates. So it is conducive to control. Secondly, the delineation of authority and responsibility is clear. The third advantage is that it enhances the authority of the managers. Fourthly, it provides opportunities for subordinates to advance because there are multiple levels. As frontline managers, they can strive through different levels. To obtain opportunities for promotion, as for the disadvantages, it increases the cost of management because there are many managers, almost 1,000 more than in a flat structure. Secondly, the increased number of levels inevitably affects the transmission of information. The third disadvantage is that it is not conducive to motivating subordinates. So today, our main focus was on learning and understanding what organizational design is the tasks of organizational design, the outcomes, and mastering the process of organizational design, as well as some related content. That concludes all the content for today's class. Thank you, everyone.